What is going on, guys? It is good to be back on here. I am uh, I'm genuinely excited to dive into these race recaps and give you a more longer form content of what goes on in these races, what goes on in the marathon prep and Ironman prep with only six weeks of training with no coach, no guidance, no nothing. And you're going to get a full in-depth review from the morning of to the swim, to the bike, to the run, the transitions, and uh, how I felt through it all. Before we get into the video or the results, I want to give a quick recap of how we got to this point, leaving only six weeks of training to get ready for a full Ironman, my first one ever. I was supposed to do Ironman Tulsa in May of 2023, two months before race day, I tore a ligament in my ankle. In September, first week of September, I had my second marathon ever and I ran a 255.05. That was my sub three attempt and we did it. For four weeks after that race, I was traveling, barely training, barely running, barely doing anything. And that left me with six weeks to get ready for a full Ironman, no coach, no nothing. So how did we get that done? Let's get into all that right now. So now we get into my expected finish times and then what I actually finished at. So we completed this race in 11 hours, 41 minutes and 22 seconds, which still sounds crazy. Um, the swim, 2.4 mile swim took an hour and 28 minutes and 54 seconds. My estimated time was about an hour 45. So smash that. From the swim to the bike, the first transition time was eight minutes and 15 seconds. Took a little bit longer because I had to get the wetsuit off and I got stuck at the bottom. Um, 112 mile bike ride. I was expecting to finish in six hours and 15 minutes. I did six hours and 10 minutes. So I was right on guess with that. Transition time from the bike to the run, five minutes and six seconds. 26.2 miles to finish off this race. I was expecting to go four hours and 15 minutes. I did three hours and 48 minutes. Sub four hour marathon to finish off. The Ironman giving me 11 hours, 41 minutes and 22 seconds to go 140.6 miles. So now I'm gonna give you a quick run through of how much time I had on the bike, swim and run and all the miles I accumulated in those six weeks. I'll put screenshots here. If you guys want a direct link to my training logs, I was also doing strength training every single day throughout these six weeks as well. I did not cut that out. And if you guys wanna see exactly what I did, just let me know. I could put a link to that or I could send it out to whoever wants it. So what I'm doing right now is looking at my template. <clears throat> the way my week went was Monday was chest and tries and then I did a bike. Tuesday was glutes and hammies, and I did swim. Wednesdays was back and buys, and I did a bike and run, so I did a brick workout. Thursdays, shoulders and core, and we did a swim. And then Friday was quads and calves. We had a long run, and then Saturday was long bike and run. Now I want to get into how many miles I put in on the bike, run, and swim week by week, and you can see how I scaled that up. Week one, I biked 90 miles, ran 12, and then swam 4,000 meters, 4,000 yards, excuse me. Week two, I biked 102 miles, ran 12, swam 1,200 meters. Week three, I biked 105 miles, ran 26 miles, so I had a little bit of a bigger run week, and then swam 2,500 yards. <clears throat> week four, we bumped it up a lot here. I biked 140 miles, ran 20 miles, and then swam 6,500 yards. Week five, bumped it up a lot. I biked 220 miles, ran 20 miles, and then swam 7,500 yards. And week six, final week, I biked 150 miles, excuse me, I'm losing my mind. Ran 12, and then swam 6,100 yards. Before I got into race day, my first time riding my bike on the road was the day before. That was it, did a quick shakeout bike ride. We did a shakeout swim the day prior, first time swimming in open water. Race day morning, woke up around 4 a.m., maybe 3.45. Consumed G1M Sport, two scoops, it was 40 grams of carbs. I had a bagel as well with some honey and tossed in some electrolytes. I also had a Welch's fruit snacks too. Um, once we got to the corrals, had to drop off the special needs bag. So the bike gear bag and the run gear bag were already dropped off the day before. The special needs bags are stuff you need um, on either mile 60 or mile 90 of the bike ride. So whether you needed more water bottles, um, candy, I threw candy in there, um, or just anything else, you put it there and then you could stop off at either mile 90 or mile 60. And then for the run, that is gonna be your transition bag where you go and get 
your belt, your shoes, everything else. So it was a stressful morning because you have to do so much before the race starts. You can't even like get into like the right mindset. And then by the time I was like, all right, let's warm up. They were like, all right, start making your way to the crowds. I don't know why I'm calling, nobody called me. Um, and that's where, you know, it started settling in a little bit. You know, I made sure I got a good warm up and uh, we threw the wetsuit on. Um, I met up with my guy, Adam, who absolutely crushed his Ironman, his first one, his first Ironman. He's also a triathlon coach and he assisted me with some advice, you know, throughout the six weeks. So Adam, if you're seeing this, thank you so much for that. And we headed over to the swim start. Now on the swim, there's time ranges, I guess, of your expected finish. I went into the hour and 45 minute fit estimated finish time just because I wasn't expecting to go fast on the swim. So now it's a rolling start. So the way they were doing this was every three seconds, uh, a, a beeper would go off and then three people would be jumping into the water and then you would go. The way the course went was you go out, you swim all the way down, you make a right, you make another right, and then you're swimming all the way back underneath two bridges. So it's just an out and back basically, just making like a little loop, one loop, and uh, you get going. Um, one of the things I was telling myself throughout the swim was just be super present. You know, don't kick too much, save the legs, make sure your hip flexors aren't burning out. I kept checking my watch and I was holding well above my expected pace. The one thing they don't, that you don't really know about until race day is how off course you're going to go on the swim. I found myself in line with everybody in line, taking sharp cuts so I wasn't wasting any space. And then I look up again and I am so far away from everybody else. The late conditions, it was dirty, very dirty. Um, and honestly, perfect temperature though. Just, just underneath wetsuit legal, which is good. Um, and yeah, we were going, uh, bumping into a lot of people. And then on my way back when I was returning, since I peek up to my left all the time, I never practiced peeking up to my right. So going out, I would only look away from where I'm supposed to be going because I'm going this way and I have to be turning right. So I don't see where the buoys are unless I stop, look up, peek, and then get back to it. That's on me. Uh, on the way back though, it helped because I was able to see the walkway of where spectators were. And about three quarter, about half a mile out from the finish, I um, was looking for my family. I was like, maybe I'll be able to see them. So I'm going, I'm peeking, I'm peeking. I'll swim on my back a little bit, see if I can see them. And then I saw them and I got their attention, waved them down. I was doing backstrokes, just talking to them, asking them how it's going, you know, not getting too caught up in my head. I like to be very present in these races, especially because I knew I had another 10 plus hours after this. We finished, I, I gave an okay to my parents, telling them that I am okay, I'm feeling good. Finish the swim in an hour and 28 minutes. Now, the one thing you don't realize after swimming for 2.4 miles, when you get out of the water, you are gonna be extremely dizzy. There's people there to catch you if you fall. I almost fell, I was leaning one way and like literally almost fell because I'm like, what in the world is going on? Then you run over to people called strippers. Um, again, didn't know that was a thing until I literally met them. They're waiting there in a line, they say, lay down. I said, yes ma'am and uh, lay down, lift the feet up, and they literally rip the wetsuit right off of you. Right from there, you have your tri suit on underneath, you grab the wetsuit, head right over to the bikes. You get your gear bag, you get changed, or you throw your bike stuff on, whatever you need, strap up, and then we get onto the bike. What I had on my bike, I had the bladder in front of me on my aero bars, so I wouldn't have to like kind of drink anything, or you could just go down to the straw. And then, so that was filled with 40 grams of carbs and electrolytes, and then an extra scoop of electrolytes, uh, of BPMG, BPN G1M Sport, and then BPN electrolytes. Um, in my little zipper bag, I had four Honey Stinger waffles, gels, and salt tabs. <clears throat> Underneath me, I had another water bottle of G1M Sport, and then on the back rack, I had another water bottle of G1M Sport. Um, after the first lap, that back rack fell off, so I lost a bottle, which could credit the cramping later on. Get off onto the bike. The bike route is three loops. On the way to the first loop, it was a little bit of uphill, but you're able to hold a good pace, honestly. First loop went great, second loop went great. <clears throat> Into the second loop, I started losing feeling in between my legs, right in my crotch. Um, again, just gonna tell you how it is. I couldn't feel in between my legs. Um, was I worried? Yes, because obviously you wanna take care of it down there. Um, I stopped to go pee three times. That's where I, the blood flow kind of went back down, started getting some feeling again. I'm like, all right, you know what? We're good. There were times on the run where I would literally have to like feel down there if like, you know, everything was still was still good. I know it sounds just brutal. Um, so whatever, we're going, I'm feeling, feeling good. 
I stop at mile 90 to get up my special needs bag, refill everything. I have uh, nerds clusters in there because I wanted some candy at that time and it was honestly a great move. Um, and then on the last lap of the bike, there was a severe headwind. I was going 18 miles an hour uphill and then 15 coming downhill. That's how crazy the headwind was. But overall legs felt good, everything felt good. My hip flexors only bothered me in the beginning. Everything was fine. Um, finished up the bike, you know, I saw my parents twice because it was the loops and I, you know, told them I'm feeling good, I'm feeling good. Once we got off the bike, that was at six hours and 10 minutes, again, right at the expected finish time. I would have liked to go below six, but it's okay. Um, my parents were right there at the, at the finish for the bike. I said, I said, I'm feeling good. You know, still got this marathon up next. Transition time was quick. I sprinted. I mean, I could barely walk after the bike, but I went to go get my special needs bags, went into the tent, changed, threw shoes on, did what I had to do, threw some muscle gel on my knees and um, loaded up my, my belt. And uh, then we got going into the run. Now in these special needs bags, you wanna come extra prepared. I had you know, an extra pair of socks, I had extra gel, extra fueling, just in case, extra salt tabs, just in case anything goes wrong, cause so much can go wrong in 11 hours and 42 minutes of racing. Um, and I never did anything even close to that. I came over prepared and uh, when I got into the run, I couldn't feel my feet for the first five miles. So there was, I didn't even know, my toe could have been broken, I would have had no clue, but I didn't stop. You know, I kept running cause I knew everything was okay down there, but I was just hoping eventually the, you know, the blood will flow back. I came out around a 7.30 to eight minute per mile pace for the first five-ish, six-ish miles. I was flying, I was feeling good. I even ran past my mom and dad and I said- You're good, man. You're doing great. You look great. What, what's going on? Just go, keep going. <laughs> keep going. And uh, I don't know what was going on. You know, I felt so good and I've been competing for seven plus hours. I'm like, what is happening? Something is just too good to be true. Uh, I stick to my fueling plan, which was every 30 to 45 minutes, I would take a gel and then I had, um, I had my handheld water bottle where I was drinking electrolytes and G1M Sport in there. Keep in mind too, there's no headphones in this race. You cannot listen to music, you can't use your phone. If you do, you are disqualified. So we were into the run and I followed that fueling strategy uh, until my body was telling me no. So my hamstring started kicking in at mile four. Other than that, everything felt good. I started regaining feeling in my feet. We kept running, we kept running. Mile seven, mile eight, mile nine, I'm feeling good. Settling in, settling in around a nine minute per mile pace now. This is where I, I told myself like, okay, I think we could hold this pace here for the next 20 miles. Then mile 13 came around. At this mile, I couldn't stomach any gels. I couldn't drink my electrolyte and carb drink. My stomach just wasn't having it. I literally could not do any of that. <clears throat> and I was getting pissed off, honestly. So what I did was I threw my handheld water bottle out. And at this point, I already grabbed my second one. And uh, I threw that one out too. And um, that one I threw out at like mile 16, but I was just like, it's nothing's working right now. So I hit the wall at mile 13, um, and this is where hell began. Now, to give you a quick recap of what happened from mile 13 to 26 for that next hour and a half, or hour 45, <clears throat> imagine that somebody had like brass knuckles on and was just ripping your quads as you're running every single step. Not only that, my back, I've been dealing with back issues for a long time, my back was killing me. On top of that, my hamstring on my right leg was killing me. That was, a, you know, I really wasn't worried about that because everything else was hurting so much more. Imagine behind your knees, right? in your hamstring where it connects from your hamstrings to your, to your calves. Imagine that every step you took, somebody just grabbed there and twisted it every single step. I did that for 13 more miles. Every step I was running and my legs would buckle out from under me. And it got to the point where I told myself, you can't tear anything from cramping. So stop being a baby, we're gonna keep pushing. Now, as these miles went on, the pain got worse. I passed my family another time and I told them, you know, this was right around the halfway point. I told them like, you know, I'm, I'm hurting a little bit, you know, I'm in the pain cave, uh, but I still gave them the okay because I can only imagine them watching me for 12 hours and, you know, throughout the race that, you know, they're worried about you, you know, the people that are watching you are worried about you. And, um, you know, it's gonna take a lot more for me to just shut down. And once, I entered into hell, I told myself, we're not gonna stop running. Cause this is when it was, this was the most pain I've ever been in my entire life. Um, from miles 16 to 26, I only had potato chips at each aid station. I didn't stop for them though. I kept running through my mouth, kept going. And then I had the little shots of water that they had. But I stuck to water and potato chips 
for 10 miles. Um, <clears throat> there's a video of me running by, um, <laughs> there's a video of me running by my family and um, at that point, uh, at that point I was, uh, I had one more lap to do. Um, or I was just on like the back end of the lap and, and I had like <clears throat> six miles left. In a good portion of the race, it gets very lonely. There's no spectators, there's no nothing. It's just you and your thoughts. So what did I do when I entered the pain cave to keep myself going? I looked at who was in front of me and I chased them down. Once I passed them, I tallied them up. And I looked at the next person and I chased them down. In the entire 26 miles, nobody passed me the entire time. I passed 651 people in that run. Nobody passed me the entire time. That kept me occupied to keep going, to keep pushing. Because every person I saw that would just run and stop and walk, taking another soul, we're going, we're going. And just kept me locked on who's next. And uh, there's the video of of uh, me coming around the bend into the home stretch and this is where the crowd starts picking up and before that though it was very very lonely and quiet for that last mile and i remember in this last mile i'm like i could walk right now you know it's okay if i do but i never did because halfway through that run i realized if i keep this pace i could go under four hours and exceed my expectations and that's what we locked on and that's where that voice in my head just came out and and um it, it's it's a crazy thing when you do very hard things it's these voice this voice develops in your head that you would just learn so much more about yourself um, and I remember coming around the stretch to finish and um, tears and everything started oh man uh, I remember just being so happy with myself that I was able to push through the most pain I've ever been in my entire life um, and finish there. And this was where chills and everything was kind of running through your body. I couldn't feel my legs. You know, I was kind of blacking out at that point. Um, and uh, I just let out these screams. Um, Ready, let's go! That you could just like hear just the uh, emotion and I'm um, just the just how much it meant to me to cross that bend and, and finish the race that I did in that amount of time with that amount of training just with just all the odds stacked against you um, and uh, I just remember screaming running down that red carpet um, jumping and just and honestly I blacked out um, and um, yeah, we finished in 11 hours and 41 minutes and 22 seconds. And Matthew Zelia, you are an Iron Man. I don't hang my head high on many accomplishments, on many things I do. That race developed a different mindset for me, developed a new voice in my head that is leading me to all these other things that when things do get super hard, I know that I did the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. What's going to come close to that? You know, and the only way this voice comes out in your head is if you continuously put yourself into the pain cave and doing these hard things and sitting on a bike in your room for five hours staring at a wall um, with nobody there. That feeling of crossing that finish line was <clears throat> easily the best feeling of my entire life. And seeing the time I did it at and then looking at my watch, seeing 140.6 miles and 11 hours and 42 minutes, 41 minutes and 22 seconds. And uh, again, you know, I get emotional just thinking about it just because of how much that race meant to me. Um, I just was reliving that, that last mile in my head. That's why I love doing all this, you know? I love doing things that people don't do. I don't know of anybody else who has done an Ironman in six weeks, uh, hitting the time I hit. I don't know, I, do, I don't. And just that idea in itself just proves to myself that I'm capable of so much more, to keep going, to keep pushing. Um, I didn't even have a bike before this prep started. I never did a swim workout in my life before this bike, before this prep started. Me tearing a ligament before my Ironman in May and having to push it off is what led me to an even better experience that I didn't plan for in November. I didn't plan on this happening with only six weeks of training, only biking in my room, only swimming in a pool. I couldn't even, I couldn't have planned this if I thought of a million different scenarios. 
I never tore anything in my entire life. And I, the first time I do tear something, it's before an Ironman to push off that Ironman to make me run one of the hardest races of my entire life. Not only that, but completely exceed my expectations. So no matter how much you plan for anything, it's never gonna go as planned because we're just trying to catch up to God's plan. You may be on sometimes and you may be way off other times. And uh, I was way off and I didn't see the picture initially. You know, when I couldn't even walk out of my bed because of my ankle, I didn't see that picture right away. I didn't see what he had in store for me leading in a few months after that, you know, later in the year. Every, if everything you set out to achieve, you knew was attainable, there's no excitement in that. There's no excitement, there's no risk, there's no, it doesn't make the reward as great. That's why the baseline for everything I set out to do, I am either don't, I'm scared to do it or I don't know how it's gonna get done. The support I had throughout this entire day was unreal. I, I don't even have words to explain of just how much that meant to me. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's why I keep going. It's why I just, I hate it. <laughs> but that's the Ironman race recap video. Um, it is my first of the race recaps that I'm gonna be doing. The next video will be my sub three hour marathon that I did coming in off the torn ligament with zero miles under my belt with a 13 week prep to run sub three, uh, which again, odds are stacked against me. Currently, I am five weeks out from running a sub 250 marathon. Um, this is for you guys to learn more about what goes into triathlons because it's an unknown space, especially if you're going in without a coach. I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you. You did it. Yeah. You did it. You did it strong too.